Good morning. Welcome to the First Presbyterian Church here in historic downtown Easton, Pennsylvania. We're thrilled you're here with us this morning, whether you're sitting in a pew or whether you're at home. Or we welcome you all. If you are visiting here, please fill out a blue card so we know who you are and we get a chance to let you know who we are as well. No, I did not try to clean my clogged snowblower while I was running. <laughs> And I will admit it took more wind out of my sail than I thought, but I'm progressing well. So thank you so much for your cards, for your prayers, for your thoughts. I appreciate them dearly. Well, thank you. It's it's wonderful to be back. Um, I tuned in the the past two Sundays, and I wanted to thank Ruth Ann, um, Bill Bartlett, Ellis, Ellis Finger, Pat COVID, and uh, the Reverend Rick Taylor for uh, leading worship the past two Sundays. I watched. um, If I were a younger person starting out in my career, I'd be a little concerned about job security. So uh, (laughs) they did a phenomenal job, and uh, I was enriched by their messages and and their worship experience with you all. So I'm deeply appreciative. Um, A number of announcements. It covers uh, front and back of a complete page, which is good news. Shows we're busy and active. Just let me raise a couple of things. Brunch Bunch today, the information's there. Office is closed tomorrow. We're giving Jonathan the day off. Well earned. New prayer ministry. Read that carefully. If you have any questions, uh, see Barry Fugre on that. He'll be able to answer them for you. Um, Rick is going to start a new discussion group. The details are there. And uh, Pat Kofoot is leading Electo Divino, which the details are there as well. If you have questions about any of that beyond what's written here, contact those people. If you're not sure how to reach them, contact the church office. Jonathan will put you in touch. I think that's all I need to say at the moment. So let us welcome each other in the love and peace of Jesus Christ. Morning. Morning. Made it. Great. All right. Um, Call to worship. 
I will read the bold that. No, we will all read the bold words together. Shall we? Come and join me for a call to worship. To you, O Lord, I lift up my soul. Make me to know your way, O Lord. Teach me the path. Lead me in your truth and teach me. For you are the God of my salvation. For you I wait all the day long. All the paths of the Lord are steadfast, love and faithfulness. For those who keep his covenant and his decrees, come, let us worship God. Please join me in our prayer of confession. O Lord, we do proclaim that you are King of mercy and grace, and that you will give us strength in every trying hour. So we pray this morning that during these 40 days of Lent, that you will be especially close and particularly strong in your love for us as we reflect on our lives and consider what we must change to be deserving of your mercy and grace. For if we are truthful with ourselves, with each other, and with you,
We acknowledge that too often we have strayed far from the path and you wish us to follow. Send your spirit, O Lord, to provide us with courage to accept the missteps and to guide us faithfully in your ways. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. No message, no misstep is too large, nor is our mind too much in denial of our true selves, for God to abandon us. In his mercy and grace through our Lord Jesus Christ, God is always present in our lives today and for all eternity. Praise be to be God. Amen. be discussing Genesis 9, 8 to 17. This reading from the book of Genesis recalls for us possibly one of the best known and most told narratives from scripture. It is likely that those who never set foot in a church are familiar with this tale of Noah's Ark, the marching of two by two into the ark and the subsequent flooding of the entire earth. Perhaps well Less well known and least understood is the dramatic and singular promise God made as represented by the rainbow. Hear now the word of God. Then God said to Noah and his sons with him, as for me, I am establishing my covenant with you and your descendants from you and with every living creature that is with you the birds, the domestic animals, and every animal of the earth with you, as many as come out of the ark. I establish my covenant with you that never again shall all flesh be cut off by the waters of a flood, and never again shall there be a flood to destroy the earth, God said. This is the sign of the covenant that I make between me and you and every living creature that is with you for all future generations. I have set my bow in the clouds, and it shall be the sign of the covenant between me and the earth. When I bring clouds over the earth, and the bow is seen in the clouds, I will remember my covenant that is between me and you and every living creature of all flesh, and the waters shall never again become a flood to destroy all flesh. When the bow is in the clouds, I will see it and remember the everlasting covenant between God and every living creature of all flesh that is on the earth. God said to Noah, this is the sign of the covenant that I have established between me and all the flesh that is on the earth. I'm gonna to go to Mark 1, 9 to 15. In this reading, Mark's Gospel, we return to the very beginning of Christ's earthly ministry. He suddenly appears from Nazareth to the waters of the Jordan River, where he is affirmed by God. Hear now the word of God. 
In those days, Jesus came from Nazareth of Galilee and was baptized by John in the, Jor in the, in the Jordan. And just as, we, as he was coming up out of the water, he saw the heavens torn apart and the spirit descending like a dove on him. And a voice came from the heaven, you are my son, the beloved, with you I am well pleased. And the spirit immediately drove him out into the wilderness. He was in the wilderness for 40 days, tempted by Satan, and he was with the wild beasts, and the angels waited on him. Now after John was arrested, Jesus came to Galilee proclaiming the good news of God by saying, the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe in the good news. I do. I do. Two words. Only two words. But perhaps the most crucial and life-altering words spoken by two individuals to each other in a lifetime. Many of us here this morning have spoken them, or if we have not said them outright, then we have certainly been in the presence to hear them exchanged. Perhaps we may have even been honored enough to ask two individuals standing before us to exchange them. I do. I do. I think that many of us who have exchanged those two words, now I'm speaking totally for myself here, I didn't have the faintest clue <laughs> at the moment of the importance and far-reaching implications on my life when I exchanged those words with Angie 57 years ago this June. Yes, I loved her dearly, as I do now, and yes, there was passion or desire in that love, and yes, I truly meant when I boldly stated that sultry June afternoon to be your loving and faithful husband in plenty and in want, in joy and in sorrow, this is the hard one, in sickness and in health, as long as we both shall live. I don't truly believe I fully comprehended that I was binding myself to Angie at that moment. I don't believe that despite the, broken pro the spoken promises that I really fully understood what I was giving up. That every significant personal decision going forward was going to be a decision that impacted two people, not just one. That I no longer possess the, the personal freedom that I enjoyed for 25 years. If we both took those vows seriously, and we did at that moment, we would be bound together for all eternity. But at that moment, I don't believe either one of us completely understood the challenges and difficulties we would encounter in the future. Neither of us comprehended the, the stress, the strain that would be imposed on those bounds over 57 years when we said, I do. For some, those bounds are broken, if not shattered by separation and divorce. Thankfully, Thankfully, our society allows for those binding vows to be untied, cut asunder, torn off. And for a while, we truly meant it when we said, I do, for whatever reason, the, the bounds were not strong enough, perhaps not flexible enough, maybe not even committed enough, nor loving enough by both parties to keep those bounds united. 
Angie and I have lived through the very painful experience of, our, of divorce with our daughter, and despite the personal agony, the second guessing of what could have been, the indelible impact on our two granddaughters, the severing of those two bonds was correct, for it allowed two people to step away from the I do and to initiate a new life of promise and hope. Essentially saying I do means to change. Dramatic, life-altering change for two people. If those bounds created by those words are going to be perpetual. In this morning's reading from Genesis, we hear God say, I do. Okay, well, nowhere in the printed text will you find God saying, I do. Not in the original Hebrew, not in the first Greek translation called the Septuagint, nor in the English version read this morning by Peter, do you find the words, I do, spoken by God. God did not say, I do, to Noah and his sons. But God clearly entered into a covenant with them. God made a specific and binding promise to them. Every bit, if not more so, as sacred as that binding in a marriage vow. But, and this is a humongous but, but there was no exit clause in that vow. No untying of the bonds in the future. No stepping away from the promise because life didn't work out as expected or as hoped. In the telling of Noah and the flood, the impact of this promise by God, this covenant, I think sometimes gets lost in the overall narrative of this ancient story. My guess is if, if, if you did a walkthrough of every nursery room in America, three out of five would have some depiction of Noah's Ark. I mean, a wall hanging perhaps, or a little ceramic figure, or wallpaper, or maybe a quilt, or a rug. When our granddaughters were two and four, they would often spend the weekend with Ange and I at our farm. And without fail, they would end up in our bed in the morning, even sometimes at night, much to our delight. We had a stuffed version of the ark, about the size of a bread, ba- bread box, for those who recall a bread box, about that big. It was full of stuffed animals, representing the, the two by two that went in the ark. So we would pull them out one by one and ask the girls, well, what's this, and what's this, and what's this? We even had a song to go along with some of them. You remember the song, Little Ducky Duddle, went waiting in a puddle? Well, that was one of the songs. Sometimes it would represent one of the animals on the farm, and all our animals on the farm had a name, so we'd ask the girls, well, what's the name of this animal? We had great memories with them in that stuffed Noah's Ark. But in truth, despite the fun we had playing with our girls, that toy Ark romanticized a horrific event in the history of humanity. for it essentially represented the destruction of creation. In previous chapters that we heard this morning from Peter, the writer of Genesis tells us, the Lord saw the wickedness of humankind was great upon the earth and that every inclination of their hearts was only evil, continually. And the Lord was sorry that he had made humankind on the earth and it grieved him to his heart. So the Lord said, I will blot out from the earth the human beings that I have created, people together with animals and creeping things and birds of the air, for I am sorry that I have made them. What follows the story, in the story we all know well, God selects Noah and his family to be the sole survivors, build an ark, God tells Noah, 
He even gives them specific blueprints, as I remember it. And when completed, fill it with a male and female member of all the non-human species. Then the rains came 40 days, destroying all beyond those in the ark. Finally, the waters abated. Noah, his family, all the collected critters are once again walking on dry land. We know the story by heart, don't we? It's at this juncture that we arrive at today's scripture lesson. God enters into a covenant, a vow, if you will, not with just Noah and his family, with all of the creation. I will establish my, the emphasis on my, I will establish my covenant with you that never again shall flesh be cut off by the waters of a flood and never again shall a flood destroy the earth. This is a covenant. This is the covenant I make for you and me, meaning God, and every living creature for all future generations. Understand this to mean that God will never ever again destroy the earth by any means. God establishes a covenant, a promise, a vow between God and all creation not to again destroy the earth. But th this isn't the standard covenant that we're typically aware of, is it? Most covenants involve two parties, marriage vows. Um, that's a covenant between two people, right? And often, covenants involve conditions, sometimes a lot of them. In a marriage ceremony, one party says, I do. Now, if the other party gets cold feet and doesn't respond likewise, <laughs> no covenant exists. No marriage takes place. As for conditions in a covenant relationship, um, if you know where your mortgage is, go home and read it, or your rental agreement with your landlord. It's filled with a bewildering list of conditions that you mutually agreed on. Both parties say, I do. But God's covenant, God's promise, God's vow to Noah and all creation, God's I do, is one way. God promises never again to destroy the earth and its creation and asks nothing in return. Now, if you consider why God destroyed creation to begin with, one could reasonably expect, I feel, that God would want some reassurances from this new creation, from the survivors of the flood, right? Like, okay, God, we also promise not to lie, steal, or kill. Or maybe that was too strong. Or, God, we promise, we promise to be gentle and considerate, caretakers of your creation. Or, or just minimally, God, we promise to do our best to be good people. But God expects nor requires any response to his I do. Seems to be in God's nature to create. So sick to his heart over the behavior of what he has originally created, God literally, literally wipes this slate clean and starts once again creating with the ark survivors. The one who created all things and stands as judge over all things and who by God's very nature is entitled to destroy all things when they prove to be so disappointing, God in a single gracious act forgoes for all time the right to destroy. It's an unheard of, unheard of surrendering of divine power. In God's promise to Noah and all future generations, God binds God's self to all future generations. He binds himself to all of humanity. 
and in fact to all the world in a totally new and different manner. God is now inherently invested in the behavior and fate of humanity, good or bad. Along with power, patience, and love, God is now perceived to be self-giving, self-sacrificing, willing to enter into a relationship that puts limits on God's prerogatives for the future. God changes. God changes his perspective on God's relationship with humanity. In fact, God makes God's self willingly vulnerable to the fickleness and unreliability of humanity. God says, I do. I do. And hopes only that we will. As a brief aside, I'd, I'd be remiss if I didn't include that this story of Noah is thought by virtually all biblical scholars to be perhaps more legend than actual depiction of history. We could spend the next five hours, maybe the next five days, delving into that understanding. Suffice it to say, for the moment, that the Israelite composed, composers and writers of the Noah story believed without hesitation that the God of Noah and God's changed character of faithfulness, love, self-sacrifice was a true reality. So likewise should we. God seals his covenant with a sign, a rainbow, essentially a, a multicolored arch in the sky. But to the ancient people, that rainbow represented a bow, as in bow and arrow. And this bow had no arrow. This bow now represented peace and love and faithfulness. Not ever again to represent a bow of destruction. And so the story of God and his relationship with humanity continues with a focus on the people of Israel and sadly, God's hopes for humanity, living in peace, living in justice, living in love, are crushed time and time and time again as we work our way from Genesis right through every book of the Old Testament. God sends laws. Maybe I have to send a few laws that will help him figure it out. Ten Commandments. Didn't work. God sends kings to give him direction. Didn't work. God sends prophets proclaiming what may happen if they don't do God's will. Doesn't work. For, God, for humanity remains corrupt, unjust, selfish, and at times just plain evil. No doubt, no doubt, God is sick of heart in the same matter as before the great flood. This is one of the great themes. I like to think of the Bible in a thematic way rather than a literal way. That's me. Here's one of the great themes of God. If God is nothing else, God is faithful. And unbelievably patient with God's creation. Finally, I, I, I kind of get the feeling God can't stand it any longer. He's not going to destroy anything. He's made that promise. He's going to keep that vow, that I do. So God decides to walk the earth God's self, to demonstrate in person amongst humanity, if you will, God's will for humanity. And are now the Gospel of Mark, considered to be the first of the Gospel writers. Jesus abruptly enters into written history in Mark. I mean, if Mark's the first Gospel you read, and it was the first one read in ancient days, Jesus 
abruptly enters. There's no prologue. There's very little introduction. In those days, Jesus came from Nazareth of Galilee. Okay? That's all Mark tells us about Jesus. Takes Luke. Takes us to get to Luke to before we, we get a little more background on Jesus. I mean, Luke's the one that tells us that Jesus' his father was a carpenter and Jesus was a carpenter, a builder, a creator, actually. And as he is baptized by John, Jesus is affirmed by God. You are my son, the beloved. With you, I am well pleased. We heard these words um, a couple weeks ago, transfiguration, right? Except in that um, delivery, that was addressed to a group of people. God said those words and said, listen to him. This is addressed to Jesus. This is a private conversation between God and Christ. You are my son, the beloved, and you I am well pleased as the Holy Spirit descends upon him. Perhaps at, at that very moment, Jesus senses a change. No longer a carpenter from Nazareth, but God's anointed with a sole purchase, purpose of teaching humanity God's will for their lives and <laughs> saving us from eternal damnation and death. I like to think at that very moment, Jesus completely understands the totality of what God is asking him to accomplish, to bear. And that response, and that response to that request from God, perhaps Jesus silently whispers, I do. I do. Doesn't take Mark long to get to the, the crucial purpose of the ministry of Jesus. Verse 14 says it all. Jesus proclaims, repent and believe the good news. It's the first Sunday of Lent. Over the remaining days of Lent, we are called upon to consider this challenge, this challenge from God through the words of Jesus Christ. Repent and believe the good news. <laughs> My guess is that it would be great joy to God's heart if each one of us whispered quietly in response, I do. I do. Amen. Another response to our church <laughs> is, I do value this church. I do value its mission, its ministry, and I do willingly share some of the blessings I received to continue that ministry. So if you want to say that I do, you can do it by placing a, a donation in the boxes, either front or the rear of the sanctuary, by sending us a check by sending us electronically. Please join me in a prayer of dedication found in a bulletin. God, you meet our needs. Transform us for service. Accept these gifts as signs of our gratitude and our commitment to witness to Christ's ministry in your world. Amen. Please be seated. <clears throat> please join me for a few moments of prayer, please. 
great God in heaven. <laughs> we give you thanks for much, for there is much to give thanks. Maybe for some of us, maybe not all of us, speaking for me, I guess, we thank you for the magic of winter. The cold, clean, brisk air, the whiteness of snow to brighten up the dark winter days. We thank you for the love of family and friends who bring joy to our hearts in days of brightness and comfort to our souls in days of darkness. We thank you, Lord, for the, the warmth of a, of a hearth or just a, a toasty radiator on a cold day and, and the nourishment of, of hot soup for our bodies. We thank you, Lord, for men and women of our armed forces, all first responders who run to the trouble instead of running from it. We thank you, Lord, for your love, for your guidance, for your presence, for your faithfulness to be with us in our good days and our not so good days. Lord, we pray for your support, your guidance as, as we contemplate our, our lives, the purpose of our lives, your willingness for our lives in these days of Lent as we look inward and think about how we can be better people. Lord, we, we pray for peace in this world, for the warring to cease, for acceptance and tolerance to all by all. Lord, we pray for all those we know who may be suffering from physical, emotional, spiritual distress we pray for relief of pain and healing. We pray for that deep grief, the loss of a loved one, for consolation and comfort from those we know who love us. And Lord, we pray for this, this congregation, its mission and ministry to this community. We pray for a steadfast hope for its future. Now please join me, join me in saying that great prayer that Christ taught his disciples and who in turn taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever. 